education and exchange with um, black professionals in international affairs. Um, the association BPIA was founded in 1989. So for uh, over 30 years now, BPIA has been bringing to the public programs regarding international affairs. And our specific audience is our membership, uh, largely African Americans and people of African descent as written in our mission statement to help our community uh, remain active in international affairs, to understand where the jobs are in international affairs, to get the support that they need to work in this field that has remained largely white across the globe. So this is our goal, this is our purpose. So the program that we're offering you tonight is definitely along those lines. If you check the chat, you'll see our website, iabpia.org. So we encourage you to join uh, BPIA, Black Professionals in International Affairs, and to become active with our organization and take advantage of what it has to offer. Not only do we do uh, presentations like the one that you're going to hear tonight, but we also have um, various objectives related to our, our educational programs, our introductions to economic activities. We have conferences. Uh, in August, we hosted over 500 um, guests as uh, in our conference and career fair. So we hope that you will consider getting active with us so that you too can benefit for, from the programs and also from the expertise that BPIA uh, brings to the table. Um, tonight, we're particularly pleased that uh, Ms. Colofello Kugler approached us about hosting this program. I'm sure there are some of you out there that may wish to host a program related to your particular expertise. So just as Ms. Kugler came to us and said she would like to do something on the WTO, she has experience. She's brought together a wonderful team of people to participate in this presentation tonight. We also have our own member, uh, Irving Williamson, also participating. They all have vast experience in international trade and, uh, uh, and can speak, will speak to us tonight specifically about the WTO. So with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator and I hope that all of you will have a wonderful evening enjoying this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much to everyone, to all of our panelists for volunteering your time to bring this important information to our community. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you, Dr. Tunga, for the welcoming remarks. We thank you for giving us this platform. And I would like to thank you for everyone for joining this platform and uh, for the WTO and the state, uh, the state of play in international trade affairs. This is certainly a timely, uh, timely topic to discuss in the trading world. My name is Faith Stigere, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. I am an independent uh, international trade consultant, and I'm also an associate at the Trade Policy Hub at the London School of Economics. So tonight, uh, we have three excellent panelists who are going to take us through what's currently going on in the trading world, particularly what's happening at the WTO and just um, an update on just international trade and the, the state of affairs of what's happening with, uh, with the WTO um, DSP settlement, uh, the dispute settlement mechanism and also the appointment process for the new DG. Uh, before, um, before we start the presentations, I'm just going to um, introduce our panelists in the order that um, they're going to speak. Um, first, we're going to start with Ivan uh, Williamson, who has over 50 years uh, experience in international trade policy and international trade law as well. He also worked as a, as a commissioner on the USITC, for which he was named chairman and vice chairman. He was also the president of the IT, ITS, uh, Trade Policy Consulting Firm, and he also served as DG Counsel in the USDR. 
So I would like uh, you guys to give a warm welcome to Ivan. Um, and then our next speaker is going to be Dr. Jan Eve Kremi. She is an international trade lawyer with over uh, 15 years of experience in international trade law. She is also currently the deputy director of the SRC of the University of West Indies in Barbados. And she also previously worked as a senior associate at Sydney Austin LLP in Geneva and in Washington, DC. She also worked as the legal officer at the appellate body of the WTO. I would also like uh, the audience just to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Jan. And then we'll go to our final speaker and a personal friend of mine, uh, Kulufelo Kugla. She is an international trade lawyer who works at the ACWL in Geneva. She represents member states in WTO disputes and provides training and legal advice on WTO law. She is also a visiting researcher at the University of Witwatersrand, which is based in South Africa. And she also previously practiced corporate law and she served as a research assistant at Erlangen Nuremberg University in Germany. I would also like uh, our attendants to just also extend a very warm uh, welcome to, to Kulu. Um, without much further ado, um, I would like to thank first, uh, I would like to thank uh, our speakers, our panelists for, for this honor that they have given us to give their presentation. And I would turn over now to Ivan with, uh, with the first question to get, uh, to get this session started. Um, just before we get started, this session has been extended by 30 minutes. So initially it was meant to be an hour, but now it's going to be an hour 30 minutes. And our speakers, you each have 15 to 16 minutes to, um, to do your presentations. And um, if you're going over time, I will give you like a two minutes notice and you will have to wrap things up quickly because yeah, you don't want to be rudely interrupted while you're, you're doing your presentation. Um, so with that out of the way, I will go over to Dr. Williamson for um, the first question. What are your perspectives on US commercial policy and the WTO? And could you perhaps give your views of what the incoming administration should focus on when it comes to multilateral trade affairs? Over to you, Ivan. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and do this talk for BPIA. Uh, as, as I said, 50 years of uh, experience in the international trade field, I was always trying to find more African Americans colleagues and encouraging people to join. And that's part of my uh, purpose in talking to you tonight. Uh, but before before getting to the WTO, let me, uh, it's been an article of faith with me for at least the last 20 years uh, that um, a good trade policy begins with a good domestic economic policy, a, a good domestic economic policies. And in thinking about what they knew, and I really came to this conclusion because, you know, for the last, since NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, went into effect, there's been a, and particularly among the Democratic Party, there's been a lot of opposition to international trade in a view that it's responsible for outsourcing and, uh, and also, uh, you know, just taking workers uh, away workers' jobs. And, you know, since I've been working in this field and I, I've been basically I got appointed as the Democrat in the Clinton administration when I came back to Washington. And so I've been concerned, what, what to explain? How to explain this? But if you do look, I think, at what makes a country globally competitive, the most important things are what is it doing in terms of its domestic economic policies? And for the US, of course, this has been, what are we doing in terms of education? What are we doing in terms of infrastructure? What are we doing in terms of worker rights, uh, 
at home. And I can go on. You, 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 what are we doing in terms of when people do lose their jobs because of international trade or lose their jobs just because of technology change? Do we have a good safety net? Do we have a way of training people so they can get new jobs where, the, where there's job growth? Because uh, basically the U.S. is much, you know, it's like 85% of services economy. Manufacturing is really a fairly small part of it. And much of much of the value added in manufacturing really comes from the services that are provided. So um, I wanna make this point just because, as I say, when people start talking about trade, they start talking about jobs, they start talking, uh, lost jobs, they, they think trade agreements are bad. And I think it, we're not gonna solve these, solve our problems unless we understand what is it, what, is, what do we have to do to make, become globally competitive? I mean, there are other countries out there, a lot of bad trade practices. Markets aren't open to us. We also have some of our own trade restrictions. But the most important thing is first, got to take care of the domestic economy and get that growing. And actually, that's what the Biden administration says it wants to do. And I don't need to labor that because I'm sure you've all heard about it. And I can point to a number of statements where they've made that very clear. Uh, and that's, that is the right approach. We got to get the domestic economy back going. But unfortunately, you know, we live in a global world and everybody, and things are changing very fast. Uh, the, it's interesting, just in the last few weeks, the Europeans just signed a, a trade agreement with, the, uh, with, with China. Now there's some things we don't like about that, but they do have a trade agreement with China. You may recall when Trump came into office, the first thing he did was get rid of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Well, those countries went ahead and implemented the agreement and now we are in a competitive disadvantage in some of the markets in the TP, TPP because they have uh, no duties and we're still paying duties on products. So, uh, and I can think of a whole host of other agreements. I mean, and now in China and the TPP countries are talking about something called RCEP, a Regional Co Cooperation Economic Program. So, you know, it's everybody else is moving forth with trade agreements, moving forth with deals. And we got, as I said, we got to get our domestic economy back, but we can't do that overnight. And, but we also cannot let our, our competitive position be further eroded. Uh, by not engaging with the rest of the world. We just, we just don't have that luxury. And I think we have the capacity to do, to do both at the same time. Uh, now, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, the trade policy formulation process in the United States because any African-Americans who are concerned of, about our position need to be engaged in their process. Uh, you know, the Congress, of course, is in particular ways and means and Senate Finance Committee to control tariffs and those, therefore, in instance, they trade, control trade policy. Uh, and they also, since the 70s, set up a, an elaborate system of how trade agreements, you know, if you, had, if you wanted to get fat, uh, ex get Congress to improve in implementing legislation for any trade agreement, you had to go through certain steps, which are called fast track. Congress required in that fast, those fast track procedures that there'd be consultation with the Congress, of course, consultation with a host of private sector groups. And while US trade representatives, chief trade negotiator, there are a whole bunch of other agencies in Washington who, who are engaged in it. And some of you probably even work at some of those agencies and know about that. Uh, and so it's not a simple thing to do. Um, so trade policy is a very collaborative, consultative process. And if we wanna have trade policies that benefit African-Americans, we're gonna to have to be involved in that trade policy consultation process and very actively engaged. Uh, and, busy, uh, and we're sort of at a, a very unique time uh, the Ways and Means Committee 
just put out a report called Something Must Change, Inequality Inequities in U.S. Policy and Society. Now, of course, they looked at, because they're responsible for tax, they looked at tax policy, looked at healthcare policy, but they also looked at trade policy. And I mean, it's really kind of a remarkable document to, uh, I mean, they looked at the many inequalities and equities and how our trade policy, the impact our trade policies have had. Uh, and as I said, many of those inequities me require adjustments in domestic policies, but some will require adjustments in the trade agreements we do, the provisions and things like that. Uh, and so it's, um, but as I said, if people are different interest groups are not engaged in the consultation process or making their views heard, and that includes whether, one of the nice things, I remember when I was at USTR in the 90s, one of the things we did was we decided to include the economic, the EPA, HSS, Health and Human Services, all of those on the, as part of those agencies that the USTR had to consult with in formulating trade policies. And that's been very important in terms of having trade policies that are consistent with our environmental objectives are consistent with our healthcare goals. Uh, there are also advisory committees involving labor, uh, of course, business, different bu business sectors, small business. But we sort of need to be part of that process so we can make sure that our interests are concerned. Uh, another reason why African Americans need to be involved in trade is that trade has a lot to do with development and particularly development. Many, many of us have, you know, either spent time in Africa, or worked on Africa issues uh, in our government positions. And we know economic development in Africa is very important. Uh, and some of our trade policies have a lot to, can help influence that. It can make a difference. One of the high points of my career was working on the African Growth and Opportunity Act back in the 90s. And that basically has been the basis for US trade policy with countries in Africa since then. And it's interesting, one of the things that agreement called for is that having free trade agreements with the country is in Africa. And now we're finally talking about a free trade agreement with uh, Kenya. Although we've got to make sure that we do it in a way this doesn't undermine the African continental free trade agreement, which is a major development and very important for, uh, for future de uh, economic development in Africa. Uh, and so that's the context in which I come to the question of the WTO. And of course, the, the US was an original founding member of the GATT, General Agreement Trade and Trade Services back in 47 and that uh, that's led to, that led to the WTO. So we've been actively engaged in that ever since. Um, you know, we're actively engaged in the Uruguay round negotiations that led to the creation of the WTO. And we've got some very important things like services and intellectual property protection in the, as part of the, those agreements. And those are the areas where the US is, is, has a competitive advantage. So uh, that was very important. Um, The other thing about, uh, so our participation in the WTO and continued participation is I think important for, uh, in terms of having a trade policy that's gonna sort of benefit all of our people. And that's one of the, one of the things we want, I think that the Biden administration has talked about having trade policies that are gonna benefit everybody. And this is a lot of that's domestic, but it also has something to do with what we negotiate in WTO. Uh, now, one of the big things that's, and Paul is gonna talk about this is the WTO dispute settlement understanding and the problems there. And I would just note in terms of US trade policy is that while we've lost a number of disputes, we've won a number of disputes there. And we've always 
traditionally have the practice that we want when, if we lose the dispute, we're going to come into compliance with whatever the disputes and whatever the uh, panels that we should do because we want other countries to come into compliance. That has for a long time was a cardinal principle. Uh, I, you have to am I going, going to you need to wrap up? Left. Two minutes left? Okay. Yeah. So, one, the dispute settlement is a much more efficient way to resolve a dispute than to uh, do a retaliation. And I did about five or six major multi billion dollar retaliation. This is in the uh, 90s. It is a very, very bloody business. And it, and usually what you want to do is avoid shooting yourself in the foot. And I think we've been doing that in the last few years. The other reason why I think the WTO is important is if we consider about the development of uh, developing countries, particularly countries in Africa, w accession and membership of the WTO is very beneficial for them because of the rules on transparency, on good governance and the decision-making uh, reform of their their laws so they can be more competitive does contribute to development. And I worked on a couple of WTO accession projects and I've seen that firsthand. Uh, so I think that, um, so that's another reason why I think we want to stay, stay engaged in the WTO because it is, it is a tool for development. Um, and it was in one last point, because uh, I think the panelists today, my fellow panelists illustrate this. People back in the 90s said, oh, the African countries weren't really involved in the WTO negotiations. They didn't know what happened. Well, they have developed over the last 20 years a whole lot of trade policy expertise and understand their interests. And my fellow panelists are reflected. People from developing countries are very active in the system. And this is good for everybody. I mean, every, because um, you want, all the countries to really be engaged. And, and that's why I also encourage uh, people on the panel who may have an interest in trade to get involved. Uh, and now stop there. Thank you. No, thank you, Ivan, for that very comprehensive and brief overview of what we can expect from the Biden administration. Um, certainly, uh, I was very curious in terms of what direction they would take, and you mentioned the importance of like the domestic economic policies, one of the main drives for the administration, and also the importance of the consultation process and the need to be involved. I think as um, going forward, yeah, there is that need for consultation and engagement, particularly from the United States, especially in the dispute uh, settlement uh, dispute settlement process. And certainly the emphasis on the importance of the WTO that we cannot, um, yeah, we cannot allow this big institution to fail. Um, thank you very much for that. And um, for people in the audience, if you have questions for Ivan, please uh, reserve them for later. We have an allocated time slot where you can address um, where you can address some of your questions. So you can just type Faith, your questions in the chat group. Sorry, Faith, I'm sorry to speak out of turn and, and I don't want to cut into Janice's time, but there's something that I haven't mentioned that really caught my attention. Yeah. And obviously this was something that was happening in the past four years. And, and of course, every single country has got self-interest, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, how do you explain self-interest versus protectionism? And is there really room for that type of trade policy, especially that the United States was so instrumental in developing the WTO rules? And then we see a little bit of change of tech with Trump. And do you think that Biden will continue along this line or will he you know, play ball um, like the US used to back in the day? Yeah, no, Kulu, thank you. You read my mind. <laughs> I, I, I definitely wanted to raise that, but I was going to do it at the end, but thank you for raising that important point. So Ivan, yeah, put a note, uh, put a pin in that and yeah, we'll get back to you on that. Um, now we'll go over to uh, Jan. Uh, Jan, here's your question. Could you tell us about the appointment of the new WTO DG? Um, I thought uh, with Roberto Azevedo like only stepping down, 
this year? Like, what's where is the process? Like, where is the process standing right now? Where are we? What is the status? Thank you so much, Faith, for the question which came out of nowhere. I mean, I didn't know that's the question you were going to ask me. <laughs> wink, wink. Um, uh, and thank you to the organizers for inviting us into this space at such a pivotal time in the history of the WTO. And I dare say even US trade policy. I think the million dollar question that a lot of us, I'm from the Caribbean, Kolo is from South Africa, and I think Faith, you're also from the African continent. So all of us who are outside um, the United States and part of the broader landscape of WTO membership, um, the million dollar question that is kind of pervading all our minds is whether and how um, a Biden administration will change the trajectory of the US trade policy and in turn, arguably, the outcomes at the WTO. A key indicator, I think, of the direction of the new USDR, Catherine Tai, who has been pegged as the, the new uh, young woman, USDR, um, is how she responds to the current stalemate surrounding the selection of the next WTO Director General or DG. And so it takes that whole process um, and what, what she does if she is confirmed takes on even more significance than a change in leadership race at the WTO usually would. So in my presentation over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm gonna look at the director general race and what I see as the implications for the US relations within the WTO. And I'm going to start, because I don't know the level of knowledge of all of the audience members here, um, so I'm going to start with an overview of who the WTO the Director General is, his or her role, the selection process for uh, determining who that person is, and in particular how that process has played out this time around. I will then conclude with some of my own views and key takeaways from this race for your further reflection. We can pick up some of the key takeaways in the Q&A. So who is the WTG, WTO DG and how is he or she selected? So every four years, the possibility to select a new head of the WTO comes up for consideration by its membership. In 2020, that opportunity came prematurely when in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, the incumbent Brazilian director general announced virtually that he would be resigning on August 30th, 31st, 2020, a full year actually before his second term had ended. The WTO agreement makes provision for a WTO secretariat that is headed by a director general. While there have been calls by some for review of his or her job description, the director general's formal role is administrative in nature, comprising on the one hand, an internal dimension, such as appointment of secretariat staff, presentation of an annual budget. And then there's a more outward facing role, which is when he or she engages with the WTO membership, when acting in an ex officio capacity as chair of the trade negotiations committee or provides good offices in order to resolve disputes. Now, as it is stated in the provisions of the WTO agreement, he, as well as the secretariat or she, um, neutrality in that role is central. And it, it has a pivotal role in retaining the international character of the institution. Despite what I would call a fairly circumscribed role as dictated in the WTO agreement, I think it is fair to say that the job of the Director General has taken on a more political, almost ambassadorial role, where the DG has been elevated to the role almost of a broker in international negotiations among an increasingly fractious membership. Um, and in the face of an organization that increasingly is being called upon to answer and to set the scene in international agenda setting. I'd say the role has taken on a thankless pattern in recent years because the major pillars of the WTO have atrophied and some would say the former darling status of the WTO has been called into question. The relevance and legitimacy of the WTO has been threatened by the China-US war increasing unilateralist measures, and now a pandemic, all of which have stretched and stressed trade relationships to breaking point and strengthened calls for WTO reform. So while I don't want to overstate it, these realities have meant that the process for the selection of the seventh director general in 2020, when it was announced, 
assumed added importance for the membership and attracted more than usual interest from both insiders and outsiders. So what's the selection process? The director generally is formally appointed by the ministerial council consisting of all WTO members following a prescribed selection process. The process is characterized by rounds of consultations and consensus building in which interviews are conducted by the WTO members with candidates or nominees from member countries. Through a confidential process, each of the WTO members is asked to indicate their rank preferences to a selection committee, which is tasked with collating these preferences. And after three successive rounds, starting with the and this course, in this course with eight persons down to five, down to two, and then one. The selection committee comprises a troika of chairs of important WTO committees, including the chair of the general council, the dispute settlement body, and the trade policy review board. So in this process, um, the, the, the entire process started on June 8th and continued until the 28th of November. Now, at the first stage of the selection process, eight members um, submitted candidates. And these members were Nigeria, South Korea, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, Mexico, Egypt, and Moldova. Now, what's really interesting about the nature of the nominees and the slate of the nominees in the selection process is that there was a high proportion of newcomers to the election process. Previous director generals have largely been from either developed countries or large and emerging developing countries. So you've seen director generals from Ireland, Italy, New Zealand. You have had Thailand and Brazil now, but really as well France. All have been male and half of them have come from European countries. So the new slate from the developing country um, membership, except for two, means that there was a high probability from the outset of the race that we would see a developing country director general emerge. Less than half a chance because three of the eight candidates were African and three were also women. So the, the South Korean candidate, the Nigerian candidate and the Kenyan candidate. And there's also, there was a chance that we would see an outsider, a trade outsider, so an outsider from the WTO emerge as the winner because you had the South, Saudi Arabian um, candidate who emerged from the banking sector and the Nigerian candidate, uh, Madam or Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, who is a finance expert. So there was a chance again that outsiders of the WTO and the trade process would elevate to the rank of director general. So this made all of the, there was quite a lot of buzz around the, the, the current um, or the last selection process. So following that agreed process, which began, as I mentioned, in June, it emerged that the final two who made it through to the third round were actually two ladies. One, as I mentioned, the South Korean and the Nigerian. In the end, however, it was the Nigerian candidate, Mr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, who was announced the winner on the 28th of October, having emerged as the consensus candidate the normal rubber stamping by the general council was expected to take place on the 9th of November by WTO members. But that was not to be, and this is where it gets exciting, that was not to be the case. Breaking with the normal consensus rule, Korea and the United States declared their objection to the nomination of the Nigerian candidate. The USPR on the day that the, the Troika announced the decision delivered a blistering statement indicating that despite the consensus, it was not supporting the selection of the Nigerian and was rather throwing its weight behind the Korean candidate, South Korean candidate, because according to the US, she's a bona fide trade expert who had distinguished herself as a successful trade negotiator and trade policy maker. In their view, she had the skills to be an effective leader of the organization, which by implication meant that the Nigerian candidate did not. As a result, the chair of the general council concluded that there was no consensus and on the 9th of November, there would be no announcement and that would be postponed until further notice, during which time 
the Troika and the chair of the General Council would engage in consultation. Now, since then, since the 9th of November, or the 6th of November, when that announcement was made, there has been no progress and inaction has characterized the process. Um, in the meantime, Ambassador Lighthizer, the outgoing USTR, has called for a reopening of the race. There have been reports that the South Korean candidate would, would withdraw her candidacy since she had not formally done so, um, but I don't know that that has actually taken effect. And there is no word from the incoming Biden administration about what its take or, uh, on the entire selection process will be. So what are my takeaways from this entire saga at the WTO? The first takeaway I offer is that in my view, the United States is on the wrong side of history here. As I indicated before, two things combined to make this race historic and groundbreaking. One is that it was a woman that was selected. The other is that she's black and African. It is hard to overlook the fact that her selection is part of a broader shift we are seeing in international and even United States politics where leadership is finally more reflective of constituencies that they serve. More and more voices of capable women are being heard. As a woman of color myself, and I imagine most of this audience, the selection of Kamala Harris was too late, but very well received. And in other corners of the world, for instance, in New, in New Zealand and in Germany, strong and effective female leadership has emerged. So, the Nigerian candidate's rise is seen by many also as part of a time for Africa. Africa accounts for 27% of the WTO membership, but still it has a marginal role in trade and stature, I would say, in trade negotiations, in spite of what is happening on the continent with the AFCFTA. And Africa has never led an organization like the WTO, the World Bank, or the IMF. And importantly, this is being done and her selection is being done without a sacrifice on quality. With, despite the United States suggestions to the contrary, Ms. Okonjo Iwela's background as a global finance expert, a managing director at the World Bank, two-time finance minister of Nigeria, chair of Gavi, board member of Twitter, Twitter gave her the edge in this race. Far from being, I would say, ill-equipped because of her non-W2 experience, she campaigned on the promise that as an outsider, she could appraise and lead reform of a dysfunctional body in perhaps unconventional and new ways. I also feel that the US's label of her as being inadequate for the job is belied by the job, yes, I'm almost done, is belied by the job specification in the description in the document that sets out what characteristics a DG should have, which is, extensive experience in international relations, encompassing economic trade and or political experience, a firm commitment to work and to work to the work and objectives of the WTO, proven leadership and managerial ability and demonstrated communication skills. And that there was also a requirement that the WTO membership select a director general that is of a diverse, that reflects the diversity of the organization. And I want to end also by the, the thing that I think is really symptomatic about the outcome of this race, which is that it further distances the United States from the rest of the WTO membership and casts some doubt about its intentions vis-a-vis -vis the WTO. As you'll hear from Kolo in her presentation, this is not the only issue in which the United States to, seems to be a little bit out of lockstep with the rest of the WTO membership. I think questions abound as a result of the US's positioning in this race. What strategy is it really pursuing? Does it want a new race or does it have nothing to do with the race and rather this is an attempt to extract other concessions from the WTO membership? Is it part of a longer term strategy of neutralizing and relegating the WTO to irrelevance? I think more worryingly is we are none the wiser about what the future holds. The new administration has stayed relatively mum, but it may be that the current, the incoming USTR may follow the lead taken by Lighthizer. I think one thing that is clear to really end is that the future of the WTO 
as shown by this race is very much in the hands of the WTO. And I would suggest that the rest of the world remains in hope that in at least as it, as it relates to this race, that the United States joins the consensus and does the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. That was, uh, that was very comprehensive and very extensive indeed on the WTO DG process. You certainly touched on topics uh, that has affected the WTO institution itself, especially when we talk about the relevance and its legitimacy being questioned due to just the general environment that has been surrounding the, the trade space and also the introduction of um, new players, especially developing countries who have been part of this process of uh, uh, even in the setup of the WTO, even though their role may not be as pronounced as it should be, but they have been there since the beginning. And I think, yes, it is the time that one and a female leader from Africa, as a person from Africa myself, I am definitely championing for her to, uh, uh, to get that position. Um, so with that in mind, your topic ties in well with the WTO dispute settlement, settlement mechanism, which Kulu is going, to, um, is going to talk about. So Kulu, here is your, um, here's your question. Could you please update us on what is happening with the WTO's dispute uh, settlement system? All right, as, as you and, and Geneva were talking, uh, you know, the Waka Waka song was playing in my head. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this time for Africa. Okay, um, so this is what I will do. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for attending. And it's really a pleasure to be sharing this very illustrious panel with you. And, and I'm very glad, you know, so far for the interventions that have been really, really interesting. And, and I'm very look much looking forward to, to the Q&A session. Um, I will, you know, set out my intervention and, and address the five, the first, the four following points, I mean, four points. So my, my intervention will go into the appellate body crisis, basically given the background as to what, how that happened. And then the solutions that were proposed to address the crisis from a multilateral and a plurilateral level. And then I will talk to you about the current state of the, you know, WTO dispute settlement as to what's happening with the disputes right now. And then just briefly give my you know, views on what I think the implications of the state of the WTO dispute settlement system uh, is for members at large, particularly for the smaller members like developing countries. Um, and so basically, uh, just let me give you a bit of background as to what is the WTO dispute settlement system before I talk about the Sapella body crisis. Um, so the dispute settlement system as we know it today was established on the 1st of January 1995 when the Marrakesh agreement or the agreement establishing the WTO came into force. Uh, you know, in the GATT days, there was a dispute settlement system, but it was completely different. So this was sort of a new and improved, you know, dispute settlement 2.0 of the WTO. Uh, this dispute settlement system is actually one of the youngest and most prolific international state-to-state -state dispute settlement systems. And it's been called the jewel in the crown of the WTO because so much pride and, you know, considered a really good uh, dispute settlement system, especially when you compare it to other state-to-state -state dispute settlement systems. So, for example, let me just give you an indication. So far, almost 600 disputes have been initiated. Actually, we're on DS 599 as of Monday. And uh, also 235 panel reports have been adopted, 146 panel uh, appellate body reports have been adopted. Just to tell you what that is. So the, the system is divided into two tiers. There's the first instance, which is called the panel level. And of course the appellate body is the panel review level. So these are just the, the reports that have been adopted. And if you look at other similar dispute settlement systems at the same time, so between the 1st of January, 1995 to the end, of last year, the ICJ of the International Court of Justice has issued about almost 80 judgments and almost 10 advisory opinion. And it loss, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea has issued 29 or 30 judgments and just two advisory opinions. So it's, it's really just given the scale, it's, it's very prolific, it's very active and members use it, uh, particularly the big members, including as well uh, de uh, developing countries. So just basically, let me go back to the pallet body now, which is what I'm going to be telling you about in this, you know, my first point. The pallet body comprises seven members, 
and three of them hear cases at a time. So three of them are called the division. And as of uh, the 11th of December nine, uh, uh, 2019, we didn't have enough appellate body members to hear appeals. And as of the 30th of November, 2020, the last term of the last appellate body member expired. So basically there are no appellate body members and for all intents and purposes, the appellate body does not exist at all. So the question is, how did we get here? So from August 2017, the United States has been blocking the appointments of the pallet body members. Why this is a big deal is because a consensus is needed to, to appoint each and all appellate body members. And the US's reason for this is that it has been, you know, complaining and, and voicing its, its concerns of the WTO for a long, long time. And it felt that this was the time to resolve them. And it used this process basically to, I mean, I would say maybe hijack you know, the process and, and try to get its voice heard. Um, but it is true. The U.S. has been complaining. It has been, you know, raising its concerns for a long time and specifically on the dispute settlement system and, and, the, and the disputes that have been, uh, dis uh, uh, have been decided, you know, since the George W. Bush era. So quite a long time. But this was the first time that the U.S. took this very tough um, and unorthodox stance. So just to give you a bit of background as to what exactly the U.S. is complaining about, and these are just, I will mention sort of the five big ones. I mean, there are some other little ones, but I'll just tell you. First of all, the U.S. is complaining about the fact that appellate body members continue to hear cases beyond their terms. And this is what they call the Rule 15, so Rule 15 of the Working Procedures of Appellate Review. Uh, the U.S. is concerned that, according to the dispute settlement understanding, all appeals should be completed within 90 days. This was not happening, and it's true, uh, you know, because of, you know, increased complexity and increased usage. I mean, about 67% of WTO panel reports are appealed. Uh, disputes were going beyond this 90 days, and, and it was very, you know, very rare that uh, a dispute would in indeed be completed within 90 days, it's usually, you know, you know, closer to, I would say, is it, is it between six, yeah, around six months right now. Um, also, the US said that the appellate body was not, uh, was giving advisory opinions. So basically, you know, making pronouncement, more pronouncement than it needs to resolve the dispute, really just going off a tangent and talking about things that were not really part of the dispute and did not need to be talked about to resolve a specific dispute. And there was also certain aspects of, you know, law and legal interpretation that the U.S. thought that it, you know, the appellate body shouldn't touch. For example, it, I mean, according to uh, to international law, municipal law is a fact, but the U.S. said that the appellate body touched upon, you know, something as, you know, usually and most of the problem with, with the U.S. anti-dumping uh, 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 regulations. And the US did not like the fact that the appellate body would go back and sort of review facts uh, when it's supposed to be, you know, looking at issues of law and legal interpretation. And the other thing is, is I'm sorry to just get into all of the sort of maybe technical stuff, but just to give you a flavor of what the US is saying, it's very specific things that uh, the US did not feel that the WTO has a system of precedence and that if a panel decides a decision or a panel body decides a decision, this should not, the legal interpretation and reason should not be used in the next dispute. So they just really did not want um, any of that at, at the panel body level or even in the WTO system because it is part of the WTO system. Now, of course, there have been some solutions um, that have been, you know, uh, sort of tried that you know members try to come up with some solutions you know members try to you know engage with the U.S. bilaterally multilaterally and uh, specifically at the end of 2018 the Walker process was launched so basically the the New Zealand ambassador who was the head of the DSP at the time the dispute settlement body which was the political head of the dispute settlement system led this informal process where it tried to you know get to some sort of understanding and and come up with some sort of you know solution to this problem because basically what it meant is that the system was was paralyzed right and there were some some solutions that have come up and uh, i mean i'll just give you maybe one or two to give you a flavor of what was you know what was you know decided generally within the membership 
that, for example, they would uh, automatically fill uh, appellate body member vacancies when they came up and appellate body members can only continue a dispute if they, the, hearing was, the hearing was held before the term expired. You know, the regular, you know, uh, dialogue between the DSB and, and the appellate body and, and the panels, of course, because some of the, the concerns of the US was that the appellate body yielded far too much power. And at the end, the appellate body, for example, if it couldn't conclude a dispute in time, it would tell the members instead of consult and ask them whether they can extend this period, the 90 day period, the famous 90 day period. So uh, there was a draft decision that was issued. This was, not, was never adopted and the US has never engaged. It never ever said that it was happy with the draft decision or it was happy with any suggestion or proposal that any member has made. The US has instead just repeated all of its complaints and concerns at every DSB and, and general counsel meeting uh, without really engaging and telling them, you know, I'm happy with this, I'm not happy with this. So till today, uh, you know, nobody knows whether the, the US's concerns have been addressed. Um, another solution that has come up is a plurilateral solution where a few members uh, led by the European Union decided that they're going to create their own sort of appellate mechanism. And they call this the multi-party interim appeal arbitration arrangement, uh, which they call the MPIA. So far, there are 24 uh, WTO members that have joined. Interestingly, China and the EU and you know, frequent users of the dispute settlement system like Brazil and Canada are part of the MPIA, but noticeably absent are members like the US, Japan, Russia, India, Turkey, and Argentina. So we don't know how this is going to work. Of course, the members that have joined the MPIA can initiate uh, appeals under this mechanism. So far, three disputes have been, not I mean, sorry, four disputes have been notified, but none have been heard yet uh, because, well, some, most of them are still ongoing. Um, but, you know, I guess we'll get to see what happens. But obviously, the US has, has raised some criticisms, including as to how it would be financed and as to how it would be supported because uh, you know they're dealing with disputes or they're dealing with appeals so how are they going to get secret secretary WTO secretariat support so in normal panels uh the WTO secretariat lawyers this we said the lawyers will support the panels but and the appellate body so, uh, secretariat supports the appellate body but this is a you know completely different body so uh, just to, I see that I have two minutes left. I just want to uh, finalize as to what is the current state of what's happening in disputes right now. And just to give you a, a few of my views as to what are the implications of the situation. So basically, as you can imagine, the pallet body crisis has had a knock on effect on the panel process. Disputes are happening and they're continuing, but uh, just for my interest, I, I tried to see what's happened last year. So uh, in 2020, only five disputes were initiated as compared to 19 in 2019, 39 in 2018, and 17 in 2017. Now, of course, uh, COVID happened last year as well, so that could have contributed, but I think maybe could have contributed to you know the stall of disputes at the beginning of the year but later i think it was really the pallet body crisis to be honest and um members have also started kind of not complying and not playing ball right because six disputes have been appealed into what they call the void so basically now there's six disputes that are sitting not ever going to be uh, adjudicated until the pallet body until and if the pallet body comes back online and three of these disputes were appealed by by the the us uh, disputes against china canada and india and just so finally, I'll just give you a, just my own opinion as to what are the implications of this. I mean, obviously, we've seen there's sort of a, a chill, right? Uh, disputes aren't really being brought anymore, although we've had our first disputes in 2021 that was filed on Monday. Uh, the system is basically on its knees. There's no certainty. There's no predictability. And um, actually, we see disputes rising in the regional context. What's interesting is that there's a, a dispute that was completed recently between the EU and Ukraine, which would, could have easily been litigated at the WTO, but it wasn't. 
And just finally, um, obviously, this is going to be dire for, for the weaker countries, developing countries, because it's become very political. This resettlement uh, has become a political tool. They'll be more open to political wrangling and possible retribution. So I really hope that the Biden administration um, rethinks the Trump uh, approach and, and really puts back dispute settlement at the heart of the WTO. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Kulu, for that very also passionate and very comprehensive uh, overview of what's happening with the WTO dispute settlement system. The system definitely has been brought on its knees. And I like the fact that you brought up the issues that the Walker process tried in terms of addressing the issues that the United States raised and the absence of engagement from the United States, which continually raises the question, what does the United States want if they're not engaging with the process? And that goes back to what Ivan was talking about. You talked about the need for consultation for this process for the United States to consult and also be part of the process. So I'm hoping that the Biden administration will uh, engage in the process in terms of reviving um, the WTO process and also in finalizing um, the DG for the WTO. They, they certainly have to choose. Um, and I guess the question also will be like, since they are not happy with the candidates. And uh, Jan, you mentioned the issue of reopening the process. So what lies ahead for the WTO, for, for the DG process? What lies ahead also for the uh, dispute settlement mechanism? Um, right now, we'll open uh, the panel. Uh, we'll open the floor to the attendants to, um, to ask questions that, um, that the three speakers um, addressed. So, if you have a specific question, can you please um, identify the speaker that you want to, um, to answer your question and also try to be specific in your questions and short and precise would be appreciated as well. Um, I think just to, just to get um, the, the ball rolling, um, I, will start, um, I will start with Ivan, like for, for example, is it safe to say that um, the U.S. national policy has been consistent over time, and the approaches, the the Trump approach has been very aggressive, if uh, to say uh, to say the least. Do you think the Biden administration's approach would be very different in terms of how they approach the DG selection process, um, and also? the WTO, the approach to the WTO settlement mechanism in terms of um, not just voicing out their complaints, but also um, engaging in the process to see what doesn't work and, and what works. And for Jan, I think I raised this question is, is there a possibility of reopening this DG process as stated per the current USDR? I know he will be replaced by Catherine Tay, and that I guess it touches into uh, the, the question that I asked Ivan earlier, like, will they still maintain the same path? Like, okay, this is our domestic policy and we're following it, maybe their strategy will, will change. But for you, do you think the, the selection process itself can be reopened um, for, for negotiations? Do they have to restart um, the process over. And um, for Kulu, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the Walker process that um, it appears that concessions were made to the United States to address the issues that um, the issues that they raised. And the United States, uh, well, they, ha they haven't responded. But do you think there's a possibility for um, a revival? Or what do you think should be the way forward? Um, based on the, the previous actions that have been done. Okay, I'll over to you, Ivan. Okay, fine. Um, the style of the of negotiations, the style of dealing with the re rest of the world would definitely change. Um, 
I mean, Biden has all made it very clear that uh, alliances are very important and you want to revitalize those alliances. Uh, and, and this, you know, consultation with your allies and all is very important. So yes, the style is going to change. What won't change is, well, one, the concern about the domestic economy, the concern about dom uh, domestic workers. I mean, after all, one reason why Catherine Ty got to the position she was because she was she helped negotiate in the Congress that you know, U.S. Mexico Canada agreement and the worker rights provisions that the Democrats wanted in it. So clearly, concern about the rights of workers around the world would be an important part of the poli uh, of our policies. Uh, the and if you think about okay. The China policy. Yes, the US will continue to be tough with China. The China is a major problem. The problem is going to war with China, go, ticking off all your allies by not signing TPP and taking those 232 disputes. And so ticking off all your allies and then going to war with China was, I think, stupid. And it didn't work. So they're going to have to take a different approach. I mean, it's still gonna to be tough with China. It's still gotta resolve the problem. At the WTO, I'm sure our style is gonna change. Uh, hopefully we can work out, these are tough di di problems. The US wanted the dispute settlement mechanism because it wanted disputes to be resolved quickly, which didn't always happen with the GATT. Uh, so there was, so you know, we wanted the system that we got. We just didn't quite want the appellate body. We did not want the appellate body and did not expect the appellate body was going to act in the way it did. And I think there are other countries who have some concerns about the appellate body. Also, trade remedies, anti-dumping, countervailing duty laws are very important. I once was told, in order to do the trade liberalization that we do do in the GATT and the WTO, you have to assure your domestic industries that if other people are unfair, there's some way to, to deal with that. And so having strong anti-dumping countervailing duty laws and being able to use them is an important part of the process of being able to do trade liberalization. And those interests are politically important. Uh, so there's got to be, I don't know how we're going to negotiate uh, dispute settlement understanding, and you probably may have to throw a whole bunch of other things in the, in the pot so you can do some trade-offs, but it's got to be done. Uh, we're not, uh, I mean, the dispute settlement system is too important. The whole idea is you want to resolve disputes quickly because if you don't, by the time you four or five years later, whatever technology you had is out of date. And so if you don't get the market access quickly, this new settlement system is not as useful to you. And let's face it, where, where the, where's the US interest in international trade? It's in high technology products and in services. So those are very important, uh, those are very important considerations. How it's gonna get done, I don't know. And one thing I have not heard any, I haven't been able to get any information on exactly what we're at. Biden administration is thinking about on the, on, the, on the DG candidate. I know what I would expect would happen and what I would hope will happen, but I'm just not sure how all that's gonna get negotiated out. Uh, okay, thank you, Ivan. Uh, I believe Kulu, you have a question for him? No, I'm, I'm not sure if he addressed the question that I asked earlier about <laughs> self-interest versus protection. So I don't know if it's, it's a sidestep or you don't wanna answer it. Oh no, I actually but... I had noted, but I forgot. Um, Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I wrote an article for something else in which I said, we got to do, you know, we're going to have to become domestically more self reliant. We got to promote our domestic production and all that, but we should avoid protectionism. That's the tricky one. And there's always a thin line. And let's face it, one of the rules I first learned when I went to Geneva in 75, 1975 is, is every, center, every country is a sinner. And the way the process works is I get you, I confess your sins and you confess mine. And so uh, it's, 
it's very hard to say when is something legitimate and when is it protectionism. And that's sort of why, uh, and the toughest fights are of course within, within any administration about policies. And, which is why Washington is always so much more interesting because people take the gloves off there as opposed to Geneva. So I can't answer your question. We'll just have, we'll go case by case and hopefully the lawyers will figure out a way to do it so that it's not protectionist, but still achieve the objectives. The first case the U.S. lost into WTO was uh, something the uh, EPA did on uh, fuel oil. And they didn't consult with the U.S. lawyers before they did it. And so we right lost the case. Oh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, Jen? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Uh, just to recall that it's whether I think there's any scope for reopening of the race. And I, I, I don't know. I, that's the truth. And I think I would uh, err on the side of caution that Irwin has kind of expressed and given me a good direction, which is, there's very little that has emerged in the public space about what, what their beef with the selection process is beyond the letter that came out at the same time that the selection of Ngozi was, 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 was actually um, made public. And that forces you to, re to think about it. I mean, I think on dispute settlements, as Kolo was saying, the US has a more entrenched, um, far, like a, a position that you can trace back I mean, a lot of the, the more recent um, trade policy um, persons that you speak to in the US will say, everybody says that Trump is, you know, the worst in terms of unilateralism and bringing the, the WTO to its knees. But this was a, a policy position taken from the Clinton all the way through the Obama administration that there were some entrenched problems that the US highlighted with the dispute settlement system. So you can see the legacy of that issue and how it has kind of yes, become more bombastic and a lot more cataclysmic in the way the, 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 the Trump administration has, has wielded that sword. Um, but on the DG race, I really, and this is why I went back to even first principles, what, what does the document setting out the requirements of a DG say? It doesn't say anything about it being a, a trade specialist. And I think, yes, the US can raise objections based on its view that in, in a sense, its view is that she's ill, Ill qualified to do the job. And I, I, I just think that's a little bit hard hitting, a little bit disingenuous for an African female candidate. It just, as I said in my initial remarks, I think it's out of lockstep with the rest of the world and the rest of the world's consensus was clearly along this candidate. So the reason for putting up that objection, I think can be questioned. Um, I think what is underpinning it may not be that there's an objection to an African woman candidate. Maybe, maybe that's taking it too far. Maybe it is that the U.S. wants to play the game of politics and trade-offs. So, you know, we will not budge on this unless you budge on something we really care about. So where is the horse trading taking place? And I think adding to that sense of lack of clarity and uncertainty about where the process is going is that Unlike in other contexts where Biden has come out very strongly about what he wants to do with climate change or what he wants to do with the WHO, I think this un incoming administration on trade, we just have to watch and see because they've been very mum on positions that they will take, um, at least in so far as the positions they plan to take at the WTO are concerned. So I think it's really a wait and see. I think there's nothing technically that in the rules of the WTO would prevent reopening of the of the process. But I think in that case, Catherine Tai and the new administration will have to bring a pretty compelling reason to the rest of the WTO membership safe Korea that has really thrown their weight behind this candidate and yeah. what objections they might have or what, um, you know, what, it what they may bring as, as the reason for reopening. I think we will wait to see. That's all I have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, that's, uh, that clears it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So far as I see it, I mean, I, I, I'm just posturing. I, I'm none the wiser. I wish I could pick up the phone and figure out what's happening um, internally in the Biden administration and the camp. But I really, as as Irving was saying, they're re like I don't know um, how you know deep these objections to this candidate go. Whether it's just posturing, whether it's something fundamental. 
Um, yeah, maybe it is um, related to the point that you raised earlier that it could be used this potentially uh, to get concessions in terms of what they want and holding uh, the, WT, the WTO DG process uh, in a limbo would maybe force people to go to the negotiating table and the United States can maybe voice out what they actually want. I mean, I, I think, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think even if I were even to take the United States at face value for what it has articulated its position to be, which is that we are in a, the WTO is in a parlous state, it's in crisis, we need, we need some seasoned hands, some old hands to guide us through. But the old hands in the past have not taken us away from the brink of crisis. So for me, the question is, are we looking for something new that can at least try something new? Because I mean, I would say as Avedo, the, the, the previous director general, you couldn't get somebody who was more au fait with rules and the technicalities of the rules. And clearly that didn't work for where the WTO is. So to me, they were, the, the position was ripe for change. Somebody with a different view. Maybe the United States thinks it's, it's too far off, you know, to, to really corral people back to the center. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I'm just wondering what the real underlying reason is. And I, I'm, I'm none the wiser. But maybe yeah, other I, panel have something more, you know, <laughs> erudite <yeah>. to say. <laughs> I guess that's the main question. Like, we don't know what the ultimate goal is. And hopefully this year in 2021, uh, not forgetting the past events that have happened that it would uh, bring in uh, some good news with the, with the new administration coming in. Maybe they will set forth a clear path for, um, for the rest, uh, for, for their needs and basically just draw a clear path of what they want and maybe help everyone on board to see how to get to that, uh, to that final destination that they want. Um, Kulu, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a, just a little comment. I mean, there's supposed to be a ministerial conference this year. Yeah. And without a DG, um, it's going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I mean, I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but <laughs> there's a good chance that we won't have a W2 DG for a while, you know? I mean, yeah, we don't yeah. know. We don't know. But as for dispute settlement, um, you know, this one is interesting because this is actually an area where the U.S. has, as, as Ivan has said, a very big interest. You know, the U.S., uh, notwithstanding all of the shenanigans or, you know, all of the things that it's done, it's, it's still, you know, the number one user of the system. You know, it's <laughs> and yeah. so it's almost shooting like shooting itself in the foot, to be honest. But that said, I think that the dispute settlement system and a lot of people may agree does need reform. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, area of, you know, improvement and growth, as we like to put it. The system worked for a long time and it's not broken, but obviously there's, there's you know, there's long delays that can be dealt with. There's probably processes that can be done away with. Maybe even the panel system can be, you know, improved upon. And for example, you know, it's difficult sometimes to get three panelists, you know, to agree on dates and Maybe we need a standing panel, who knows? But I think that uh, we're not gonna move forward until there's change, to be honest. And, and for now, in my opinion, I think that we're going to have no appellate body for a long time. I think, I mean, I don't know what the Biden administration is and, and if it's keeping intact with, as you know, Geneva saying from the Clinton era going forward, nothing's going to move until something changes. And um, sorry, Kulu, uh, just when, when you're just from that point, so does this mean this is the end of the adjudication process? <laughs> no, no, I mean, I think it's, I think we said goodbye for now to the appellate body. Uh, there will be panels, and as I said, the dispute has been already initiated, but at more, much lower levels that we've seen before. I mean, last year we only had five new ones. And um, yeah, and the, I think the region, the regional dispute settlement systems might, you know, experience a revival. You know, they've been sleeping for a long time. So, I mean, I know there's one, the EU versus Korea, the EU has initiated a dispute against the SADC and the EPA, 
and the EU and the Ukraine and these others. And so um, maybe this would be the future of dispute settlement, uh, at least trade dispute settlement. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an option, but it's just not multilateral. Um, just one more uh, question on that. So with the MPIA, it was sort of like crafted as a temporary mechanism. Do you see that as something being developed into or potentially a future dispute settlement mechanism to replace the appended body or we need a very brand new system? Away and and I mean I invite my co-panelists to 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 voice their, their, their comments on this. Um, actually, Janine, <laughs> yeah. weren't you part of the Sydney group that talked about Article Twenty Five? I think it would be interesting to hear Janine's uh, 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 viewpoints. But it, in my opinion, is um, as I said, there's very major exclusions from the MPIA, and I don't see those countries jumping on board anytime soon. Okay. So it'll always be a side thing for, you know, a few buddies, you know, sort of a, a gentleman or whatever club for the few that are willing. Jenny? No, I, I, no, I agree. I think when we drafted it, which was for, oh gosh, when was I at Sidley? <laughs> 2017, when that was drafted, it was very much conceptual. I mean, I don't think we were really thinking, or at least I wasn't thinking about the political buy-in at the time. It was just put forward as a technical option. I think and now sitting as a developing small island um, researcher, um, the calculus for joining is very different. Um, you know, first of all, the United States hasn't joined. Now that's a major signal to many smaller countries that are dependent on the largesse of the US. You don't um, and even some of the larger countries that are excluded, notable exclusions, South Africa, India, the larger economies, um, you, you know, there's a lot of political reasons why um, that's not appealing as an option for a lot of people. And um, a lot of, I mean, I've looked at this question quite closely, trying to figure out well, what would require, what would you need to bring on these, these naysayers into the process? And it, it's, it, it's a very varied. Um, and I still don't think that I, and even in the, the words of the drafters of the MPIA, this is meant to be a short-term interim solution. So nobody's seeing it as really a longer term strategy for dealing with the, 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 the removal of the appellate body as a second tier option. So I think all of these things kind of coalesce to, to make it not a very viable long-term option. And one of the things I've looked at is, well, why not engage in some of the alternative means of dispute settlement that are provided for at the WTO that are heavily underutilized, but may have much less um, financial implications for smaller countries who use the WTO dispute settlement very sparingly. Um, so like good offices, mediation, like really revamping these and making them more attractive options. Um, I also see lots of other options now that we are online. Um, I think the sphere of dispute settlement is going to become much more dispersed. I think it's not going to be localized in Geneva if we continue with this online um, basis for determining decisions. I think panelists can come from other parts of the world. I think law firms from developing countries may have a greater stake in dispute settlement if they're not required to really have an office in Geneva in, in order to litigate a case. So I think it's going to lead to decentralization of dispute settlement. So I think MPIA is one option. I just think it's one of many other options. Um, but at the end of the day, the critical view of whether you need a second tier system of, of dispute settlement in order to bring more consistency, to bring more legitimacy um, is the open question. I think people are railing against that notion and thinking, well, why don't we just make the panel system um, much more uh, robust? Um, and so you do away with the appellate body. And I think that's the experiment we're engaging in now. I think it's not a good sign, as Kolo was saying, that the uptake in disputes has gone down. I think COVID is one reason, but I think COVID has happened at the same time where you've seen an increase in unilateral measures, which would suggest to me that you would, would find more countries mm -hmm. with cases. But I don't think people are really seeing it right now as a viable option because of everything that's happening with dispute settlement. So, I'm talking a lot about about problems and not really coming up with solutions. But. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. I, I think, yeah, I, I, 
I think they, 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 there are definitely a lot of uncertainties um, with this dispute settlement process. And I guess the future will tell in terms of what, um, what system they will come up that will get a lot of buy-in from, uh, from the other participants. Um, we have a question from the audience from Tori Jackson. Um, I think any one of you can answer. It's not really addressed to anyone. So yeah, so what are the long-term impacts uh, turn to 30 years if the US continues out of step, excluded from the rest of the world in its trade policies? Thinking of the EU and China trade deal recently, um, recently signed, the regional comprehensive, um, the RCEP signed in November, is there still time to reverse course? I think there's still time to reverse course. Uh, one of the things is, if you're going to do all these economic reforms, you want to do them so you can be globally competitive. And part of being globally co competitive is having trade agreements that give you market access that is comparable to what your, your competitors have in different countries. So I think the thing that the Biden administration is going to have to come to face with is that yeah, well, we know we want to focus on our economic policies first. We can't, we got to keep up with the rest of the world. And there's a lot of good, and, and we, we stand to gain a lot from, from doing that. So um, I think the, 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 the course that the Trump administration was pursuing was not sustainable. It wasn't succeeding. Uh, and also, they weren't doing anything domestically that to, ch to change our competitors. So yes, it's, it's got to change, and I think it will change. And as I said, we we can do both domestic reform and economic and international negotiations agreement and all at the same time. Uh, Hi. Um, does anyone have any um, anything to say on that question? We have about three minutes before we wrap up. I feel like I've spoken a little too much, but I think that's a really critical question and a really important one to end, um, you know, this webinar on. Because, I mean, if I if I deconstruct that question, the first one, the first question is, is it excluded from the West of the world in trade policies? I would say it's out of step at the WTO certainly because of um, some of the positions it's taken. But it's also very much in step on some issues, like the approach to China, bringing China a little bit more to heel in terms of. The applicability of some of the rules um, to China, and I think it's it's not excluded from being a very attractive partner outside of the WTO. Everybody still wants to have a FTA with the W with, with with the US, and I think the US has to take a very very definitive stance on how it sees its trade policy being most effectively executed. Is it that its future lies at the WTO, or is it should it really start doing more one on one bilateral trade deals? I think the rest of the world is going to have deal with that reality. Because if the US stops seeing the WTO as a viable way to negotiate um, and, and become competitive, as Irving says, if it doesn't see the WTO as the path forward, we will have to deal with a, a less than um, multilateral WTO without the United States. That's a reality the rest of the world will have to take on board. And I think it will force countries to think outside of the WTO box, other options for pursuing trade policy. So I think it's, it's a great question, but I'm not sure uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very easy question. Yeah, I think that, no, I think it's an easy question. The US has got to do both. You're going to have to pursue your bilateral agreements. You're going to have to pursue the WTO. Sometimes you make progress bilaterally and that puts pressure on the WTO process. Yeah. The way we got the Uruguay round agreement was we were starting doing things in Asia and some agreements there and after. And the Europeans sort of woke up and said, hey, wait a minute, that's, <laughs> we better do something. So uh, you, I want to use the word trade liberalization, but that's not the thing. You, get, you pursue yeah. your trade agreements where you can get them. Yeah. And you keep going. One thing I want, uh, just want a, a quick note, because uh, uh, um, we started out talking. I don't know if we'll be allowed to, to stay further. We have like one minute left. And you can have it. You can have it if you want. <laughs> you can have my time. Oh, no. I, I talked about Blacks participating in, in international trade and trade policy. And I want to note that Alexander Whitaker has replaced Catherine Tai as head of the trade subcommittee at House Ways and Means Committee. And first time we've had an African-American in that position. So we're making progress. And I think that's 
that's important. And she actually um, may be on this oh, call. Yeah, hoping <laughs> hi, if she is. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I want to thank all the oh panelists. Oh my gosh, she is. <laughs> Don't you have a question? Uh, do you have a statement, Alex? It would be lovely to hear your reaction to anything we said. <laughs> I'm afraid. And of course, she she's also been in Geneva too. Like thank you. Thank you. No, I do not have a statement. It's been nice to be a fly on the wall just listening to this <laughs> conversation. So, so thank you all for putting it on. Um, the issues that you're talking about are the same issues I talked about today with um, the chairman and others. So it's sort of very timely to have this discussion. So, so thank you for having this. And thank you for your kind words. Um, um, and we wish you good luck because you got a tough and job. You have all the, all the power of this panel and I'm sure that this entire BPI behind you. So congratulations and we're proud of you, Alex. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's great. Okay. Um, so I would like to end this session now and I would just like to thank all the panelists for their excellent presentations. I certainly came out of this knowing more than when I joined it. So thank you very much for those very insightful, um, very insightful presentations, even though they were done in a very compact manner, but the information was very well communicated. And I hope everyone benefited um, from this discussion. I would also like to thank the BPIA for giving us this platform. Um, to participate and just to, to share uh, some of the views of what's happening in the, in, in the trading world and the WTO. And we also just like to thank all the participants who joined us for this session. And we we'll like, we'll just want to say thank you. And we hope this was very beneficial for you. And we want to see you back here for the next, uh, for more events. And yeah, for me, um, good night and I think it's good evening to you guys. So, and thank you, moderator and co-panelists. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.